I'm going to go ahead and start off by welcoming everybody to today's webinar. I'm Cheryl Lynn from NCAP, and I am joined by Emily from PAN. And we're really happy that everybody can attend today. Um, we have a great webinar in store for you. Uh, we have two expert presenters and migratory pollinators, which are pollinators that we don't normally hear about when we talk about Pollinator Week. So I'm going to go ahead and get into our first speaker. Juan Moreira Hernandez is a Costa Rican tropical ecologist and PhD candidate in biology at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. He studies interactions between nectar feeding bats and the flowers they pollinate in tropical mountain forests of Central and South America. In addition to being a scientist, he has worked for more than 10 years as an environmental educator ecotourism guide and teaching assistant and coordinator of field ecology programs with the Organization for Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. He's also actively engaged in science communication and outreach through storytelling, nature photography, and social media as he believes weaving and sharing stories around the fascinating natural history of our planet's biodiversity is a powerful tool for conservation. Juan's presentation today is titled Fur, Wings, and Flowers of the Night, The Fascinating Relationships Between Nectar Feeding Bats and Their Flowers. The floor is yours, Juan. Yeah, thanks so much, Harry, for the introduction. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not longer muted. I'm gonna share my screen real quick so everybody can see the presentation. Uh, all right, okay. Um, well, uh, thanks so much for the invitation to share a little bit about the fascinating stories um, shared between bats and the flowers they interact with as pollinators. Um, my own work focuses on, on these interactions and try to understand what's the relationship between bats and flowers and how they have shaped each other's evolution. Um, so this is a topic that I always love to talk about. Um, okay, so first off, just a quick um, overview of bats. Bats are mammals. Hopefully most of you already know that they are furry animals and they, the females of the species of bats uh, produce milk to feed the offspring when they are very, very young. So these two traits are unique to mammals. Despite any other differences in physical appearance, if an animal, if an animal has these two traits, it's uh, undoubtedly a mammal. Uh, but what makes bats very unique is that they're, they're they are the only mammals capable of true power to flight. Uh, and they do that by having the amazing, amazing adaptations of their hands, which are highly specialized to form wings. Bats' wings are shaped by very elongated arms and hand bones. As you can see here, they have a very small, stubby um, thumb and then very long second, third, fourth, and fifth fingers that provide the main structural support for the wing membrane, also called the patagium. Uh, and because the wings are made by these very specialized hands, um, the scientific name for the order that groups all bats is called Chiroptera, which comes from Greek uh, words meaning hand wing. Okay, uh, and basically the ability to fly uh, defines pretty much every aspect of the life of bats uh, and make them have a unique life history that is very different than many of the other groups of mammals. So, well, uh, largely because of their ability to fly, they have been incredibly successful ecologically worldwide. They are found in every continent. There are 1,400 species of bats. That is the second most uh, uh, successful in number of species group of mammals worldwide only behind rodents and roughly you can think that of every five mammal species um, two are uh, rodents one is a bat and then the other three are any of the other mammals that you can think about so they have been incredibly successful and as you can see here this is just a small sample of a species with different faces different ears different noses different uh, fur colorations, different eye size, and behind each of these species, there is a fascinating and unique ecological role that they play in their ecosystems where they, that they inhabit. 
Um, so overall, the closer you get to the equator, um, or tropical areas have higher number of species. In the US, there's around 45 species of bats. Um, and the, in Canada, there is about uh, seven or eight, I think, all of which are shared with the United States. But if you go south towards Central or South America, then the number, the number of species uh, for those countries increases rapidly. A country like Costa Rica, which is roughly the size of West Virginia, uh, for example, has a, uh, 115 species of bats. And a country like Ecuador has around 143. Brazil has way more. Colombia has way more. Peru has way more. Um, so yeah, many of the of the the, the the vast majority of the species are found in the tropics. But everywhere where bats occur, they play an incredibly important role in the ecosystems. Um, so just briefly, uh, there's two main groups of bats um, that are popularly known uh, within the Ordin Caroptera. The one group is has traditionally been um, known as the megabats, and that includes the largest bats in the world, some of which have a wingspan that can be six feet in length, so from tip to tip of the wing. So some of those uh, are in very extremely large, um, and they are re restricted to tropical regions of um, Africa, Southeast Asia, Northern Africa, Papua New Guinea, and some Pacific Islands. Uh, the, but the other uh, group of bats, which is by far the most numerous in number of species, is called the microbats, and that's where the vast majority of the species are. These are the bats that are nocturnal, uh, and uh, well, they are all nocturnal, but these ones are the ones that we think about when we think bats, because these are the ones that we see everywhere uh, um, flying around at night in this part of the world. All of them are microbats. And these are the ones also that are familiar because they, they collocate. That means they navigate at night using um, very strong high frequency calls that bounce off objects, return to the bat, and the bat can get information about its environment in this way. And megabats do not have this ability, at least not, not like microbats. There's a few exceptions, but that's largely the case. Um, and uh, in both groups, we find uh, certain species of bats that are, have become specialized to become nectar feeders. So in the old world, we have the nectar feeding bats uh, that are known as uh, the, the, the old world pollinator bats. Um, and these are, again, common in uh, tropical parts of Africa and Asia and Australia. Uh, when in the new world nectar feeding bats, we have uh, much smaller species of bat pollinators that have the ability to hover. So these bats are able to visit flowers and drink the nectar while still remaining suspended in the air. The, the bat pollinators in the old world, all of them have to perch in order to feed from flowers. These, these bats here on this side of the world, they don't perch. They, they can drink the nectar from the flowers um, while hovering, uh, much like hummingbirds do. Uh, but this is very difficult, like uh, aerodynamically, in terms of like the, the special type of flight that they need to have for that. Uh, but only bats in this side of the world do it. So some of these are like the ones that I study. So these are all from tropical species in Central South America. But uh, I want to make this this uh, talk more relevant uh, to to the audience. So um, I want to focus on the three uh, species of specialized. Uh, bat pollinators found in the in the United States. Um, two of those are the Leptonycteris bats or long nosed bats, the greater and lesser uh, species, and then the Mexican long tongue bat. So there's a fourth um, uh, on assuming bat pollinator that is, uh, oh yeah, these three are also migratory. The fourth species is, uh, is uh, unlikely because the, um, it's actually an insect eating bat but opportunistically it feeds on nectar and, and, and pollen from flowers. And when it does so, it also acts as a pollinator, uh, even though its main part of the diet is insects and other small animals. It's called the pallid bat. 
So uh, to talk about the Mexican long-term bat real quick, this is, this, uh, this is the smallest of all the four. It has a highly elongated snout uh, and it has a wing membrane, um, um, sorry, wing membrane, not uh, tail membrane between the legs, as you can see in the photo here, uh, that looks like it's wearing a skirt. This bat is common in, um, in Arizona and south, extreme southwestern California, uh, and readily visiting home feeders at night. And you see it during April to September, uh, yeah, in extreme southwestern, uh, southwestern California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The next species is the greater long-nosed bat. This is the biggest of the four. Uh, it's large with pale brown fur and the tail membrane here is reduced. So it looks like uh, it doesn't have the skirt, uh, but it actually looks like it's wearing pants. And that's one way how you can identify it in photos or if you have a good sight uh, when you see it, like visiting your, your feeders. Uh, but this is a very rare and endangered species, at least in the US, the larger part of the population occurs in Mexico. But in the US is considered um, endangered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's found in southwestern New Mexico in the Anima Mountains and in Big Bend National Park in southwest, uh, southwestern Texas. Uh, typically are, uh, above 3,000 feet of elevation, only from June to August. And then the uh, lesser long nosed bat. Uh, here in this photo, you can also see that this as the greater length uh, long nosed bat also looks like it's wearing pants and not a skirt. So that's um, one, one easy way to identify it. But also it's a smaller and the fur is shorter than the greater long, uh, long nosed bat and the fur is more orangey. It's also endangered, uh, but although in, it's more common than, than the greater long nosed bat. And it's found in southwestern New Mexico and so, uh, southern Arizona below 3,000 feet from April to September. And then there is the pallid bat. This species is um, different than the others in terms of, of like, since it feeds on insects and spiders and scorpions, centipedes and other things, this has a different um, characteristic. So this one has very, very long ears, uh, a very, very pale fur, and it has a very, very long, a uh, visible tail between the two legs and a very long tail membrane as well. So that's another difference. And um, it's common and widespread in all types of arid environments across all Western US. And it's not considered endangered because of its uh, large range. But the southern populations that occur in the deserts of Southwestern United States um, opportunistically feed on nectar and, flow and, and pollen from cacti and agave flowers. Uh, and when they do, the bats get all covered in pollen, their faces and, and, and the upper part of their bodies. So they are so act as pollinators. Uh, so the main uh, pollinator habitats for these bats in the United States um, include desert and canyons and scrub vegetation, both near the coast and, in, uh, and inland. Uh, and for the, uh, the greater long nosed bat that likes to, to go a little bit higher up in elevation, um, that species uses oak pine forest as well. Uh, so the main, uh, the main plants that they feed on is multiple species of agave, uh, including the agave tequiliana species found in Mexico, that is from which the old tequila is produced. So the next time you drink a margarita, make sure that you toast to bats. Uh, uh, so when the agave pl plants flower, um, if you were there at night observing the, the, the huge inflorescence structure that the, the plants produce, you'll see like swarming bats um, being um, crazy active all night long, um, gorging on the nectar uh, and eating the large amount of pollen that this inflorescence has produced to the point that often if you catch a bat here, like using a mist net, uh, the bat will be completely covered in pollen often and then will be like all orange. <clears throat> and then they also uh, feed on, on nectar and pollen from, from species of uh, columnar cacti, uh, including saguaro and organ pike. Uh, so they, they visit the flowers and uh, eat the pollen 
drink the nectar, but also later in the season, they also go to the fruits and feed on the seeds and the pulp uh, and also disperse the seeds. So in this case, the bats play a double role as pollinators and seed dispersers for these uh, desert plants. Uh, so in terms of the, is, um, the, the behavior of these species are, uh, is migratory. So during most of the year, the species are found mostly in Mexico, um, central and southern Mexico. Uh, and it's only during the spring and summer that they are found within the United States territory. So the, the migration that is better known is the one by the lesser long-nosed bat, especially the northern population that um, here in blue, you see where they occur during winter and during the fall, uh, sorry, during the spring, they start migrating north along the coast following the sequential blooming of some species of uh, agaves and, and other uh, cacti plants around the coast, the coast until they hit the Sonoran Desert and, and, and um, area here in, in, in northwestern Mexico and southwestern U.S. and that they, that's where they hang out during the summer months. And that's also where the females give birth to the pups. Um, and so there is a number of caves here that are extremely important for the conservation of these species because those are maternity colonies where, where the females give uh, a, a, a group and uh, give birth. And then they feed on the, on the, the, the agave and, and cacti plants uh, nearby during the summer months uh, while providing for the, for the pups uh, during, during, uh, in preparation for the migration south during the fall. Okay, and the, south, the southern populations are resident during Mexico and they, they have a different uh, ecology completely. The greater long nosed bats also migrates, but this is far less understood. But what is known is that it uses uh, the highlands of central Mexico and it follows also uh, a highland corridor um, no, uh, northeast of Mexico into Texas and New Mexico um, that corresponds to the to the, the, uh, the sites where many high elevation agave plants are found. And that includes uh, about 10, 12 species that flower during the different times of the year. And that's where these bats move. Uh, but this is far less understood because many of these areas here uh, are, have remained uh, a little explored. So we know far, far less about the movements, the seasonal movements of the greater longnose bat, unfortunately. Um, but as, as I'm sure Gail will mention later, this, um, this kind of like highland corridor here also plays a big role for the, 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 the migration of the monarchs. Uh, and in the case of the Mexican long toes bat, this is the most abundant and, and widespread of the species. Uh, here in red, you'll see how um, the species move. So this is during the spring. In the summer, they go north. Uh, sorry, uh, this is the summer. So most of them are like yeah in the Sonoran Desert area. This was uh, the spring and this was the winter, yes. And this is the fall when they start migrating south back again. Uh, so in terms of conservation, uh, both the long-nosed bats, the greater and the lesser, are considered endangered by both Mexican and and, and uh, the U.S. state authorities and federal authorities too. Uh, and the other two, the Mexican long-nosed bat and the pilot bat are currently not considered endangered, uh, but this might change in the, in, in the future. Uh, and I wanna highlight the, the special relationship between some of these bats and tequila production because it's a very successful conservation historic history real quick. Uh, so basically all um, tequila mezcal in the world is produced in central Mexico in large tequila plantations that cultivate agave plants in a setting as the one you see here. So large swaths of land completely devoid of other vegetation, just agaves. So this is not great habitat for wildlife in general, uh, but you will think that it would be at least good habitat for the bat, except for the fact that unfortunately for uh, the traditional uh, way of producing tequila involved the, the harvesting of the tequila uh, plants before they flowered because these plants flower once and then die. So if you wanna uh, produce tequila from them, you have to harvest the plants before they invest in producing the flower, flower inflorescence structure. 
So that's going to draw a lot of resources from the plant. So you want to uh, collect the plant and then harvest it um, before it does, right? In order to maximize the, the, the quality of sugars that you obtain for a uh, fair plant. Uh, so during the expansion of agave cultivation, unfortunately, that traditional way of, of doing, of harvesting agave, uh, devoided uh, large areas of the Mexican landscape of any food resource for the bats. Um, so that's why during the later ha half of the, of the past century, their numbers decrease substantially throughout, throughout the range. But, um, and here, and it, it affected mostly the two species that to this day are still considered endangered as uh, the, the, the cultivation and uh, the production of mezcal and tequila affects uh, the vast majority of the range of the lesser and greater long nose bats. Fortunately, uh, this changed in the last 20, 25 years as uh, different uh, uh, collaborative efforts between the tequila production companies, academics, and conservationists in Mexico uh, started to, to, pro uh, to create um, practices of farming tequila, uh, tequila plants. Uh, that were more friendly with the bats, uh, and that culminated in our certification program that was created in 2014 to uh, grant tequila and mezcal brands a bat friendly certi certificate uh, for uh, good manage management practices. Uh, what the, the most important of these practices involved the, uh, leaving 5% of the agave stems per hectare. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, it says per plant here, but it's per hectare. The 5% of the agave stems per hectare are allowed to flower in order to provide food for the bats during the time of the year that the bats um, are found in this part of the range where the killer production takes place. And you might not think that 5% is a lot, but because these inflorescences are so huge and produce huge numbers of flowers per night that produce copious amounts of nectar, uh, this just happens to be uh, enough for the for the to supply the, the dietary requirements of of, in, uh, of bats, um, and so some of there uh, there's an, a number of tequila brands that have obtained this certification. It's called the Bat Friendly Tequila Project, um, alongside the University Nacional Autónoma de Mexico and the Tequila Interchange Project. And the chief um, pioneer behind this effort is very famous as the Batman of Mexico. His name is Rodrigo Medellin. He is a huge mammal conservationist in Mexico and uh, outstanding uh, professor of mammals. Okay, and then to finalize, I just want to briefly touch on other threats that these pollinators face, including the disturbance of cave roots. Uh, especially the maternity colonies uh, by recreational activities, but also mining. Uh, are huge threats. Uh, the uncontrolled expansion uh, of, of uh, human habitation into, into the desert habitat. <clears throat> uh, in some parts of the range, also the exploitation of wild um, food plants, including agave and cacti, can have impacts on these species. And uh, regarding pesticides, since these species mostly feed on, on, on plants that are uh, generally not cultivated in, uh, and, and, and spread with pesticides, the, the, the data on the effect of pesticides on these pollinators is very limited, at least within the United States and Mexico. As far as I know, the one single study where uh, trace amounts, very low amounts of DDT was found in these pollinators' bodies uh, was a 1976 study um, that um, actually documented a bunch of bat species in Arizona, in southwestern Arizona. But uh, the, of all the species that were sampled, the, uh, the lesser long-nosed bats had the lower amounts, but the amounts of DDT and other uh, organic chloride, uh, organic chloride uh, pollutants was uh, higher, a lot higher for the insect-eating bats. Uh, so for example, so that these, um, there's no, no evidence that uh, currently pesticides might be affecting these bats. 
but because this is an old study, maybe new studies should be conducted uh, uh, soon again. And there is potential that, for example, the pilot bat can really be affected because that one uh, does eat insects and, and scorpions and spiders and other animals. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I went a little bit over time. Um, yeah. Basically, uh, yeah, that's what I had prepared uh, to share. Perfect. Thank you so much, Juan. That was great information that I, myself, as a wildlife biologist, was not aware of. Um, and I'm sure everybody else was really excited to hear about. Okay. So next, let's go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, our second presenter is Gail Morris, and she is the coordinator of the Southwest Monarch Study. She's a citizen science research project based in Arizona monitoring uh, butterflies in Nevada, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Western Colorado, and the deserts of California. She's also a Monarch Watch conservation specialist and serves at the vice, as the vice president of the Monarch Butterfly Fund and the Central Arizona Butterfly Association, as well as the new Western Monarch Advocates Board. Gail has authored several Monarch publications and dedicates her time training citizen science to participate in Monarch research, education, and conservation efforts in the Southwestern United States. The floor is yours, Gail. Thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate the invitation to share some information about Monarchs. You could see in this picture, as I'm getting this ready, some of the tags we use to actually mark uh, monarchs so we can see where they migrate to, this little blue tag um, here. So give you a little information about us. So here's a little bit of background about what we do. In the Western United States, the Rocky Mountains are the big divide of where monarchs uh, migrate to during the winter months. Um, it used to believe that the monarchs east of the Rocky Mountains all went down to Mexico and those west flew to the coast of California for the winter months. Um, there are three tagging organizations here in the west. Uh, the Southwest Monarch Study is here in the blue. Uh, monarchs, uh, butterflies of the Pacific Northwest are based up in Washington in the pink, and you can see uh, monarch alert in the coastal California area. So we tag monarchs every fall. And as a result of that, because we are in the field so frequently, we get to see the benefit of where the largest number of monarchs are and what kind of habitats they prefer. From tagging these monarchs, we have learned that in the Southwest, some of our monarchs migrate to the same overwintering sites in Mexico as monarchs do from the East. And some of ours also fly to the coast of California. In the right slide, um, you can see the red lines coming down from Washington, Oregon, and through Idaho. Uh, from the tagging groups there. And you can see there's some overlap in the California area, which is kind of interesting because in the spring when the monarchs disperse, monarchs that originally started in Arizona and flew to California could end up in Washington this time of year. It also shows that it's, there's a few uh, outliers in Washington area going through Idaho, almost indicating that they could go to uh, Mexico as well. So we keep learning new things uh, by participating together with citizen scientists that we train to monitor their movements. We also are very engaged in monarch conservation. We help people with starting monarch habitats in backyards to uh, help the population grow, but also we've received a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to spread uh, monarch plants, uh, uh, monarch uh, nectar plants and milkweed throughout um, many of these organizations you can see listed public lands. So to be real clear, just to um, understand a little bit about the monarch life cycle a little bit, this time of year, all monarchs are breeding. 
and there haven't been too many sightings in Washington, but they are up to Oregon and Idaho, and hopefully reports will be coming in from the state of Washington soon. Um, monarchs need milkweed. It is the only plant they can lay their eggs on. It's called a host plant, so it is the only place that a female will lay their eggs. And luckily for all of us, there are over 30 species of milkweed across the United States. In the spring, summer, and fall, they also need nectar plants. Uh, they will lay eggs on milkweed before it's even flowering. And in the fall, we'll learn in a minute more about that migratory generation, they really don't need milkweed anymore. Breeding monarchs this time of year live about 30 days. So they're very busy mating, laying eggs, and continuing their life cycle until about 30 days when that new monarchy closes and, and uh, continues their movement in the area. This time of year, they tend to stay in the general regional areas where they are. They have just ended their spring migration, but there may be movement around, and that's why we're still hoping we'll hear monarchs in the Washington area. The monarchs that come out of a chrysalis in August break that cycle of continuing to mate and lay, breed and lay eggs. And instead they fill up on nectar. They actually become the migratory generation and they can live up to nine months. I think uh, one was found last spring that actually had been alive for at least 10 months that they know about from tagging. We know the date they're tagged and when they're seen again. These monarchs are not breeding, and that's what enables them to put all their energy into their fall migration, this long migration. So they really need fall blooming nectar. And so that's why it's important to have uh, flowering plants that bloom in the early spring, summer, and fall. We mentioned that milkweed is their only host plant. So these are the things they need for a nice monarch habitat. They need nectar. They need trees or shrubs to spend the night in, ideally. It also protects them in weather extremes. Um, and we have found in the West that in general, monarchs need to have a, a water source or some moisture nearby. Those are the areas that seem to have the largest monarch breeding populations this time of year. Some of the biggest uh, populations in the Washington area that Dr. David James wrote about in a paper that he published last year was along a river area that had a huge amount of this very milkweed, the showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa. That is probably the most common milkweed in the Western United States. And it's not from monarchs only. We'll see a lot of other pollinators visit this plant. So when we mention these ideal Western monarch habitats, this is one area. This, this white flowering plant is a milkweed called horsetail milkweed or Asclepius subverticillata. It's usually found in the southern parts of the southwest. Interestingly, when you think of the Sonoran Desert, we think of dry uh, cacti, uh, very coarse, um, hard um, habitats, and yet this is in the middle. There's a lot of little seeps and water areas in, amid the desert um, hardscaping. And this is one of the, uh, air, this field in particular, we can tag over a hundred monarchs in an hour and a half during the migration in Southern Arizona. They also need fall nectar that we, we mentioned. And so in public lands area, we're always looking for areas that can uh, prosper both the milkweed but also fall nectar. In this case there's native thistles that are in blue and we can't see in this photo there's also sunflowers in the distance. And we mentioned water sources. By the time they reach the southern United States from the long journey from Washington or Oregon or Utah, 
they're thirsty and the very dry climate here, if they can't get moisture from the uh, uh, nearby area or the trees where they are, we'll actually find them in creeks or streams. So we also encourage people to add milkweed to your own yards or places of worship or places where you work, public parks. Um, we work, as we mentioned, with public lands. So we're always encouraging people to plant milkweed for breeding monarchs and to help migrating monarchs with stands of uh, common sunflower, rabbit brush, uh, which is pretty popular throughout the West, asp, asters, other fall blooming plants. So the important thing is where you plant. Uh, so look for locations near seeps, creeks, ephemeral streams. Look for mature trees and shrubs to the west in particular if you're in an area that happens to have harsh afternoon sun. It gives them some shade relief when temperatures get high. Look for natural swales or roadside ditches uh, that seems to collect rainwater when they come. Or you can create a roadside drainage depression that collects rainwater in an area to help these native plants prosper. We encourage people to collect native seeds for your best success. Uh, they're best acclimated to your local conditions. For example, if you mail in and order seeds from a place in Missouri and you bring them back to Idaho, the weather conditions aren't the same. And while they may grow for you, they may be more successful if you can find these plants, identify them and collect the seeds locally. And here you could see uh, we've just, uh, the, I don't know if you could see this right here. This is a seed pod here and we've just covered it. So uh, we don't have any competition from anything damaging this pod itself. You can increase native nectar sources and milkweeds already are, that are successful in the region. And you wanna plant them in groups together so they're visible to monarchs or other butterflies or other pollinators flying over a region to visit. Now, one of the things we always encourage everyone to, and this is partially why you saw that covered milkweed seed in the last slide, is you wanna collect milkweed seeds before the milkweed bugs do. They have an affinity for uh, milkweed seeds themselves, and they will actually damage the seed coat and render them infertile. So at times if someone said, I collected some seeds, and they never grew for me. A lot of times it's because these milkweed bugs that you can see here all over these seed pods um, get to them first. In this particular case, these little milkweed bugs will actually line up right on the seam where these like to pop open. This is a, a milkweed called um, Antelopehorns, Asclepius asperula. And you can see when they pop open, they're like, it's like a, a pillow fight if you ha ha try to open these indoors. They just puff and fly away. They get airborne pretty easy. But these little guys are all over them trying to grab them first. So you want to store them in a paper bag if you find them in an envelope. Be sure to label the species and the date you collected them. I think all of us could tell you stories of, I'll remember what that is, and we don't. So uh, be sure to label them, let them dry out um, outside or on a desktop for a while before you plant them. Milkweed seeds are good for several years. I've started seeds as old as four, five, six years old. Of course, they're best uh, during the first two or three years after you pick them. For many, many years, uh, we've seen roadside uh, fields of milkweed in the ditches along the roads where you can drive through. You can see the speciosa milkweed here growing here. It's not in bloom yet, but when we look closer under the leaves, we found this monarch caterpillar. So um, a lot of times this is where we used to see them in the west. The problem started coming up when ag fields nearby though 
started using more chemicals that started running off into the water into these roadside ditches. This is a new study that came out. We definitely could spend a whole time just talking about this, but this is public access. You could find this online about the pesticide contamination of milkweeds in um, Northern California. The reason this is so important for monarchs that spend the winter along the California coast, they have to fly through these fields to be able to get to you in Oregon, uh, Idaho, and, and uh, Washington. And so when they're feeding on flowers, if they're on, on to regain their energy, or if they're feeding on milkweeds in bloom, this is just a sampling of all the chemicals they were able to find in them. They found over uh, seven com compounds in over 50% of the collected samples. 17 compounds were found in 10% of the samples. Oftentimes there were multiple uh, compounds in the same uh, sample they took. Uh, you can see here that the uh, higher number of pesticides are found in ag fields and also retail samples that we were purchasing from stores that many of us would buy for our own homes. Um, this was the second study that showed this presence of chemicals. So we've heard of studies uh, where bees were very negatively affected by uh, uh, encountering uh, pesticides in the field. But we were wondering what is happening with butterflies and monarchs in particular. And Dr. David James at Washington State uh, recently published a study on uh, the, the use of neonicotinoids in a sugar solution fed to adult monarchs. He just did a uh, a simple experiment where he fed some of those monarchs uh, a solution um, that had neonicotinoids in it and another was a sh plain sugar solution. Uh, but you can see what happened as a result of that. Those that were treated with the neonicotinoids in sugar had a 78.8% mortality compared to those that uh, the 20% that were fed un, uh, untreated. As a result of that, monarchs look like they're okay when they're first feeding on flowers around us in our yards, but their lifespan is dramatically shortened when they encounter the chemicals that could be absorbed through these plants. And that's one of the major problems. These are not uh, chemicals that are just sprayed on plants. They're put on the, as a soil drench and absorbed into the plant and then eventually uh, into the nectar that um, butterflies and other pollinators feed on. Uh, they showed signs of some toxicity as well with uncoordinated wing flapping, uh, vibration of wings and body. Interestingly enough, it did not affect them forming eggs, so they were able to create, uh, uh, to still uh, make eggs to be able to deposit uh, milkweed. Uh, his final conclusion is we really need to study this more and what's happening. So if you're planning to grow a pollinator garden, make sure you're using as organic methods as much as possible. Make sure you know your grower if you're not a, a gardener yourself and ask what they are using on um, plants and plugs. Remember though that your uh, plant nursery may not have grown those plants. They are actually grown somewhere else and shipped in. Uh, so it'll be a multiple step process to find out what they are using. And remember that organic does not mean it won't harm larvae and become aware of which chemicals are or not. I cannot tell you enough how many times I have called and they said, oh, we just use this chemical. We know it doesn't harm anyone. And if you look it up, it'll say effects of, of butterfly larvae. So this is why we have this concern. Um, this, is, this is the monarch population in Mexico. And you can see how the monarch population used to be very high. 
And then back in 2013, 2014, we had a huge crash of the population. And since then, it has slowly come up, although we came back down again this last year. And you'll notice overall, the numbers here are much lower than what they used to be earlier. California is even more dramatic. Look at the, uh, what has happened in here the last two years. This last year in 2019, the overwintering comes went up a little bit versus the year before, but it's almost uh, insignificant. I am hoping and I have faith um, as a person engaged in conservation that we will see those numbers increase, but it's gonna take all of us working together to try to pre uh, create a very healthy environment for monarchs to be able to thrive, as well as all the pollinators with them. This is information if you'd like to get a hold of me with anything, uh, any questions you might have, and I will do my best to um, try to uh, uh, refer you to any res local resources that would benefit you. Wow, thanks so much, Gail. Um, I actually had the pleasure of doing a little bit of work with Gail, um, just on looking for some good locations for when she was working with the Arizona Game and Fish that was on the list. Um, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Go ahead and share my screen one more time. So now we're going to go into the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, looks like we have a couple here. All right. Emily, you want to go ahead and start? Reading those out. Sure. Um, so the first question from Rebecca asks Juan, um, clarifying that none of the bats you were talking about would be found in Missouri, where Rebecca lives. Is that true? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, there are no nectar feeding or pollinator bats in Missouri. Um, yeah, the, the, the ones that occur here in the United States only live in extreme uh, Southwest, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Yeah, unfortunately. And you're located in Missouri too, right Juan? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, he will be just way too cold for them. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Jean asking Juan, um, I think you covered this a little bit in your slides, but the primary causes of the decline and endangered species status of the greater and lesser long-nosed bats. And do you have any recommendations of how we can support these species in the US, like habitat restoration, native pollinator plant plantings, et cetera? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So much of the, uh, the, the largest impacts that affected this, uh, these animals, um, took place uh, in Mexico, uh, mostly in Mexico, during, during the last 50, 60 years or so, um, when, when uh, tequila production really took off, and then large parts of the landscape were transformed to, to, to that uh, monoculture um, um, style uh, plantation of, of agave plants that didn't allow for these plants to flower and then provide food for the bats. So that's where, where most of the populations uh, really started to decline significantly. Uh, because in Mexico, they started to, to take more action and stronger actions to, to help the bats in the last 20 years or so. The, the populations are bouncing back, but this process is taking time. Um, so for what it's possible to do within the, the United States, uh, I think the, the most important thing is perhaps to protect the, the desert and cave habitats. That's extremely important for them during their, their summer uh, here in the United States. These uh, animals are reproducing, so most of the females are bearing pups and giving birth. Uh, so they need good quality habitat. They need uh, a, a sufficient numbers of their food plants um, so that they can provide for their, 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 their they're young, they're pups. Uh, so yeah, uh, but 
I, I, I think that the, the, the overall perspective for me for these bats is, is, is largely positive because of the efforts that uh, were taken uh, uh, to, to increase the, the friendliness of the tequila production in Mexico during the migration time. Uh, but yeah, definitely protecting caves and, and their habitat and, and the desert habitat as well is super important. Great, thank you Juan. Um, the next question from Cheryl is for Gail. Um, was there any, I think this is referring to the neonic study you were talking about. Was there any further study of the eggs that had hatched? Uh, what percentage hatched? Were they affected with nervous disorders? That's a great question. And it was the first question we asked uh, uh, Dr. David as well. Um, he said he, that wasn't his focus. His focus at that point was to see what happened to the adult butterflies, but that is what he is recommending for follow-up studies. I know of several studies in, pro in progress right now um, where they're also measuring the different amounts of neonics uh, saturation that they're using to see if there's any difference. Um, the amount he used was actually what's uh, normally recommended in the field. So we'll have to wait for more information on that. Great, we'll keep an eye out. Um, and I think we have two questions here just um, asking if Juan and Gail can share their contact information that were on your slides. I know those disappeared kind of quickly. So maybe both of you can just put that in the chat box so folks can take note of it, how, how they can um, see more of your work or get in contact with you. Um, and then a question from Becky wondering, what kind of bat might be eating squash in Houston, Texas? A friend saw them eating her squash fruits. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I'm not muted. Um, okay, so in, in Houston, Houston is like central Texas. Um, it would be really hard to know with, with, without more information. So uh, other than the bats I mentioned, all the other bats in the US and Canada uh, feed in insects uh, and spiders and scorpions and other arthropods, except for a few species that um, are found also in Florida. But I am not aware of any other that have made it into Texas. Um, yeah, if, if, if there was a picture or something, I could guess. Um, but I would, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that perhaps uh, the bat that was eating a squash could have also been feeding on any insects, uh, eating on the squash or being on the squash. Uh, yeah, but it's, 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 it would be hard to know without at least uh, an image of the of the, the um, of the culprit. Thanks, Juan. Um, we have a, we have a couple minutes left. If anyone has any extra any last minute questions to type into the box. Um, and I also just wanted to share that we will be, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll be sharing it with attendees. It'll be accessible on um, NCAP's website, I think, and Pan has a website called Honeybee Haven, um, where you can find more resources. Um, and I think we'll also be putting together a little resource uh, PDF document that folks we'll get that I think we'll also have um, more on Gail and Juan's work and how to get in contact with them. Um, I'm glad that you covered that, Emily. I just wanted to thank everybody for attending today and I hope that this was really good information for you guys. Um, like I said, this is a, a group of pollinators that we're not, well, especially me, are not really familiar with. Um, when you think about pollinators, you think about bees and maybe butterflies, but um, not so many bats or specifically monarchs. So um, yeah, that will be the end of the webinar today. Thank you very much.